Okay, a very warm welcome to our session on innovation and sustainable development in the South Atlantic. It is a pleasure to be here at this exciting event and to be hosting a panel that focuses on our region, the South Atlantic. The islands of the South Atlantic very rarely feature in global fora. We span vast distances and have very small population sizes, yet our isolation arguably drives innovation. And there are many examples of island-led innovation in our region. This session focuses on innovation and sustainable development in two islands of the South Atlantic, St. Helena and the Falkland Islands. And you'll see in our panel, we have one group from St. Helena. Do you want to say hi, everybody there? <laughs> and one group in the Falkland Islands. Hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> So we would like to thank our sponsors for the Falkland, the Falkland Island government and Enterprise St. Helena and Island Innovation, of course. I'm Tara Palembi and I'm the Deputy Director of Innovation at SARI, the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute. You'll hear more about us later, but I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, so as I said, our panel is comprised of island-based politicians and experts who will be showcasing some exciting case studies. With populations of 3,000 in the Falklands, and I have a map here just to make sure that you all know where we are. So th in the Falklands here, and 4,000 in St. Helena, all the way up here in the tropics. We're going to demonstrate how knowledge economies are being developed that include the global export of technical skills, renewable energy goals are being set that have the potential to be world leading, and the new fiber optic cable projects are driving change and broadening the scope of, for sustainable development. But just before I introduce you to our speakers, our wonderful speakers, as well as showing you where we are, I wanted to give you a taste for our amazing islands from the underwater environment of Ascension to the kelp forests of the Falklands, from the whale sharks of St. Helena to the volcanic terrain of Tristan da Cunha. But most importantly of all, I wanted to introduce you to the people of our islands. This photograph is from the last year's first ever South Atlantic Regional Conference, which was hosted by St. Helena and attended by participants from Tristan da Cunha, Ascension Islands, the Falkland Islands, and South Georgia and the South Atlantic Islands. After our first face-to-face -face regional conference, now we are here this year, virtual and global with a regional panel and it is with great excitement that I now introduce you to our panel of speakers. So our first speaker is Dr. Paul Brickle. Dr. Brickle is the Executive Director of SARI, as well as a reader in Biological Sciences at the University of Aberdeen. He has led SARI since his inception in 2012. His interests include shallow marine ecology, community ecology, and biogeography of small islands, He's an active member, active diving member of the Falkland Islands based Shallow Marine Survey Group. So without further ado, Paul, over to you. Thanks very much, Tara. Hello, everyone. It's fantastic to be here. Um, if you just bear with me while I try and work out how to share my screen. Great. Well, um, I'm also very grateful uh, for the opportunity to be able to speak today. Um, it's great to be part of such a large um, group um, on islands. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the Falkland Islands of experience in developing a, a knowledge economy. Um, so just to give you uh, uh, some context about the Falkland Islands. We're a population of about 3,000. Um, our economy is reliant on three main sectors, agriculture, fisheries, and tourism. And uh, there's always been a need to develop um, and diversify our economy uh, um, away from just these three sectors. Um, so uh, back in 2010, um, the Falkland Islands Development Strategy highlighted the importance of developing um, new economies uh, to diversify um, to diversify the economy. And the SARI proposal offered an opportunity to develop a sustainable knowledge-based activity and one that had clear synergies with um, our 
strengthen the environment and sustainable use of natural resources and conservation. Um, you might find it a bit odd to think that this, this might be possible in a small place, but uh, um, if you could coordinate uh, the, a number of scientists arriving on the islands, they'll spend their money here and, and so on, um, and thus increasing the benefit to, to the islands. We have many unique selling points um, here uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of global, globally important science and so on. Excuse me a little minute. Um, I've got quite a sore throat, in so just hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Water. Thank you. Yeah, so we have uh, many unique selling points here um, in the islands. Um, as, as much so as, 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 as many of the sub-Antarctic islands. Um, and these include uh, um, clear skies to observe uh, atmospheric science, um, large amounts of peat uh, for looking at uh, past climate. Um, peat is a little bit like a black box flight recorder, um, so it can tell you a lot about past climate to inform future climate. And also, um, we have hugely productive uh, ecosystems and testament to that are our globally important seabird populations uh, and also uh, our, our large fisheries. Um, we're also kind of unique um, as an island uh, and contrary to sort of ecological theory one would expect our diversity to be lower than it uh, is on the mainland. This is not the case here and the reason for that is we weren't completely glaciated in the last ice age meaning many of our subtidal and coastal plants and animals, particularly in the marine environments, weren't scoured away by ice. So our populations became founder populations for southern South America and even further afield. In fact, if you look at a couple of our kelp species, Falkland Island haplotypes genetically dominate all of the south, uh, southern hemisphere, right, for, right around to the sort of Indian Ocean and Pacific sectors of the subantarctic. Um, so uh, you can quickly see how a uh, small base knowledge economy can, can uh, impact the economics uh, of, of the Falkland Islands. Um, so if you had a coordinated mechanism to allow scientists to arrive and do their work here, uh, they'll spend their dollars, uh, euros and pounds um, in the community, in hotels, hiring vehicles, potentially um, um, retaining local labour to maintain experiments, etc. And of course, as a small institute grew, it would apply for its grants, apply for grants in its own right, and also um, and also employ uh, scientists here in the islands who will obviously spend their their salaries here and also pay tax here. Um, so, for a population of three thousand, um, this this can be quite significant. Uh, and just to give you some some metrics, uh, um, um, Sari, it just Sari itself in terms of science uh, activity. Uh, will generate about 2.5 million pounds a year, and this is growing year on year. Um, so, so really, um, quite a significant impact to a small population uh, economy of small with a population of three three thousand. We were a government-based uh, um, uh, department, although albeit arm's length, and this allowed us to undertake commercial um, activities as well as uh, as well as uh, academic ones. Um, and in 2012, we split from FIG. Uh, as, as uh, was FIG's intention and our own to become a private institute. We're a, a registered UK charity um, based in England and Wales and we're also on the charities register here in the Falkland Islands. Um, the charity also owns a limited company and this allows us to do uh, commercial work and is a source of unrestricted funding uh, to allow the charity to, to undertake its charitable objects. Um, our mission is stated here um, we want to grow a sustainable um, environmental research institute based in the Falkland Islands um, and operate across the South Atlantic and beyond. Um, um, and it's important to note that in small places like, uh, like the Falkland Islands and elsewhere, um, these sorts of uh, activities can only be successful if uh, they're centered around uh, uh, collaboration and partnerships. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the work we do just to give you a bit of a taste of, of, of the breadth. Um, these are kind of listed here um, and uh, we'll go into some examples uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, 
this idea of creating a knowledge-based economy in the Falkland Islands has also uh, resonated uh, uh, amongst some of our other uh, overseas territories, uh, um, partners and friends, um, and uh, in collaboration with the uh, Anguilla government and the Anguilla Community College, um, we developed uh, um, with them the Mid-Atlantic Environmental Research Institute, and similarly on uh, Centralina, with the Centralina Community College and Centralina government, who are here today uh, as well, um, um, there was the launch of the Centralina Research Institute. These are really exciting, and the idea is, is obviously to, to try and, and mirror and create uh, knowledge economies in, in those areas. Um, another centre of excellence that we developed, uh, um, that this focuses on remote sensing um, in the southern cone of South America, um, and this is the Austral Earth Observation Alliance. And the premise behind this is these, er, these areas are lightly populated, they're difficult to mobilise to, so using satellite-based and remote sensing technologies uh, make it far more cost-effective to, to conduct work in, in these areas. Um, this gives you an idea of our reach. Uh, currently we have about 14 staff, um, that's growing, 10 res uh, associate research fellows and 8 PhD students. And um, we work mostly based in the South Atlantic, although we have a base uh, currently in Turks and, Qua uh, Turks and Caicos with the Turks and Caicos government there. Um, um, and uh, we're also conducting work in Chile and, and uh, some Southwest Africa too. Just a little bit uh, about some of our work. So we've, uh, we did uh, some of the first surveys on Ascension Island uh, um, back in 2012, 2013, and with Ascension Island gov government developed uh, a program called the Ascension Island Sustainability Project, as you can see. Uh, from this picture, um, there's a huge abundance of fish um, and interestingly um, the diversity is relatively low although it doesn't look particularly low there uh, until you take a closer look and in these inside these structures these pyramid forming coralline algal uh, towers there's lots of interstitial space and there's a hidden diversity uh, which makes it a really interesting place to, 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 to work. We also looked at uh, how higher predators utilize the marine space there in terms of MPA design um, using satellite tags and stuff uh, uh, like that. So this is a, um, a spot tag and a PSAT tag on a Galapagos shark. And this track here shows you a tiger shark, uh, um, obviously clearly didn't like being tagged, rushing off to, to Brazil uh, to, to get away from its painful experience. Um, and, and all of this data is really important to inform, inform uh, um, um, uh, marine management areas, sort of uh, management and, and so on. A lot of our work goes into scientific journals like this one here, a special issue on Ascension Island work. Some of our work briefly here, um, our taxonomy is not well known, it's a frontier area, so we have to work with uh, organisations like the Natural History Museum to create uh, taxonomic tools to uh, allow us to understand um, you know, taxonomy and look at impact, especially with uh, regards to things like new developing industries like oil industry and so on. We also need to know how our higher predators move around our seascape to understand, this is an example with uh, some oil, uh, oil um, licensing blocks, how, uh, how, 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 how our biodiversity interacts with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with the oil industry. Um, we're also uh, using science to help design marine management areas. And this is an ongoing topic, so a lot of that includes uh, um, work in the near shore. As I said, it's highly biodiverse and, and we need a, a lot of baseline to, to fully understand it, to design monitoring mechanisms uh, in terms of management. And uh, to get to deeper areas, we use larger vessels like, uh, uh, like the Birdwood Bank. Um, this is another example of some of the work we've been doing in South Georgia and also here in the Falkland Islands, and this is creating habitat maps as baseline using remote sensing and, uh, and um, that satellite uh, technology, as well as drones to, to create uh, habitat maps as baseline for, for, uh, um, for, for terrestrial protected area, as well as uh, visitor management and so on. Um, so that just gives you a small, small idea of what we do. There's a, a great deal more, um, some of it's highly technical. Um, and also gives you an idea of how small uh, island economies can diversify uh, and, and use knowledge economies to, to increase economic uh, uh, sustainability within, within, within their own economies. Um, so I would like to say thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking today and uh, yeah, very happy to take on any questions. Okay, brilliant.
Thank you so much, Paul. Um, really interesting introduction to Sari. So we'll take questions at the end of the session, um, the Falkland session. So we have three speakers from the Falklands. We'll take some questions from the Falklands then. And then we have the second half of the session, which focuses on St. Helena. We'll take St. Helena questions after that. So I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Denise Blake. Denise is the Environment Officer and Policy Advisor for the Falkland Islands Government, covering a wide portfolio of environmental policy advice to the government. She's also studied a PhD in Geography and is a Fellow of the Geographical Society. So Denise, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tara, for that introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Denise Blake, and as Tara has mentioned, I'm the Falkland Island Government's Environmental Officer. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about the environmental pathways that we're taking towards sustainable development of the Falkland Islands. Uh, the Falkland Islands um, are a remote archipelago, and so why does sustainability matter in that sense? We are our own discrete geographical unit, and whilst we're connected to the global environment, our own environment is a finite resource. As a small and remote island ecosystem, ensuring sustainable development that is not just for our economy, but also for our environment and community is key. We are faced by many challenges that I'm sure many of you can empathise with. We are small. Uh, so however big our problems are, they are a literal drop in the ocean uh, compared to elsewhere in the world. And talking of oceans, we are actually surrounded by our seas. Um, and so we're physically removed from any mainland and have distinct challenges in that sense to overcome. And also being small, um, we've got a population of just uh, over 3,000 people. And whilst we're all proud of our environment, um, we're really proud of this environment, uh, this amazing environment that we call home. And so for the next few minutes, I would like to share some of our pathways and experiences with you, and particularly how we embrace the environment alongside our efforts at sustainable development. I'll provide you with a brief overview of how we leverage renewable energy sources to supply our homes, our plans for developing modern waste management solutions, The boys are moving masses around. Sorry, the presentation's not on the screen. Oh, that'll be why. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, uh, providing, uh, yeah, so, so I'll be talking to you about how we leverage renewable energy sources to supply power, power to our homes, our plans for developing modern waste management solutions and how we are ensuring that we protect the environment while we deliver our planned developments through environmental impact assessments. So firstly, let's talk about renewable energy sources. Stanley is our capital and home to most of our residents. Unlike in smaller settlements, our electricity provision is provided through our public works department as a public service. Ensuring a reliable supply of electricity to Stanley is vital for our quality of life. And so we harness our energy supply from a mixture of sources, fossil fuel generators, and since 2007, wind power. Those of you who have visited the Falklands know that the one thing we have in between all the rain and the occasional sunny day is wind and that in abundance. And in fact, actually our wind here, uh, our wind speeds are about five knots above those that you find in the UK. So when we came to assess the need for renewable energy sources, wind power seemed like an obvious choice. We now have six wind turbines located a short distance away from Stanley that supply up to 40% of our annual electricity. Now, I know that doesn't sound like much in the overall energy mix, but we unfortunately have the opposite problem of many places in that it sometimes is too windy and we've got to turn our wind turbines off before they um, blow off into the South Atlantic. Um, of course, uh, we're also looking at opportunities uh, to better leverage that wind power and increase the renewables in the energy mix available to us. So although we're not 100% wind powered, our harnessing of this natural resource has had a tremendous impact on reducing our global footprint. 
uh, reducing our carbon uh, emissions by up to 5%. <coughs> Um, areas outside of Stanley are commonly referred to as camp. This originates from the Spanish word uh, campo for countryside. And uh, settlements in camp are relatively small and they mostly consist of only a few buildings inhabited by a couple of families, mostly involved in sheep farming and other agron uh, agronomy activities. The energy provision for camp is not off the grid. Um, instead, each settlement has its own uh, energy supply. And unlike in Stanley, at this small scale, renewable energy sources are probably the easiest to maintain and the most reliable. Uh, though many farms have backup diesel generators, 90% of inhabited farms on the Falkland Islands uh, get their main source of energy through renewable um, powers, uh, such as wind and solar. And so, as you can see in the picture here, uh, this is Harps Farm on uh, the West Island. They're powered by both wind and solar energy. Uh, to ensure that um, access uh, to these energy sources is available for farms, farms can apply for an energy grant scheme, which is run through FIG's partner, the Falkland Islands Development Corporation. Uh, they provide grants and technical expertise uh, in ensuring that the supply of renewable power is obtained for farms and is accessible for farms. Grants are not only available for new installations, but also for uh, being able to store that energy. Um, as we move on to another sort of global problem, um, and as we look towards the media, we are constantly bombarded by news about marine waste and our global pollution problem. As island nations, we are not exempt from this problem, and so we see it as our responsibility to cater for the future of waste management on our islands. Over the past few years, we have made major strides in ensuring that we do not compound this problem further especially as our population is growing. In 2018, we agreed a waste management strategy that we are busy implementing. Again, in developing this alongside our response to waste management, we're faced by the usual problems of being a small island state. First of all, we produce waste, but in the grand scheme of things, we don't actually produce that much. And so whilst it's a lot for us, it's in the global sense, it's not actually that much. And secondly, we are remote. We are 8,000 miles away from the UK. So our solution was based uh, looking at the waste hierarchy and really focusing on the top few, uh, which are to reduce our waste as much as possible. Um, and then obviously seeking other treatment options and making sure that we have the technologies uh, and the reliable technologies available for treating that waste appropriately. So far, the implementation of our strategy has been a success. We're working together with our community and our local businesses on our reduce campaign. People have been encouraged to reduce their reliance on single use plastics and can now find sustainable alternatives in our supermarkets. Plastic carrier bags have been mostly eliminated and most retail businesses have entirely switched to sustainable alternatives such as the paper bag. Um, and in 2009, 2019, we started our online uh, on island glass crushing as one of our recycling schemes. This is now used for building purposes, reducing the, um, our reliance on natural alternatives. So by collecting glass, we are crushing it and using it as a substitute aggregate instead of crushed rock. At this point, I want to note that in finding sustainable recycling outputs, it is important to us that we don't want to dump our problem on someone else's doorstep. Over the next few years, we will have invested £4 million in developing a modern landfill site and associated with waste treatment facilities. As we look towards these technologies, we are fortunate that our population is becoming increasingly environmentally aware. And although we are, there are big changes to come in how we look at waste and how we treat waste, what is expected from our community is going to be really, really critical in ensuring that they understand what is expected of them and ensuring that community buy-in is, that is what is critical to our success in this project. And talking of our community, our community and the environment are both central to our planning and development processes, uh, which are to, covered by robust EIA regulations, uh, that's environmental impact assessment regulations. This means that all major developments are subject to an environmental impact assessment and, when necessary, a social impact assessment as well. All applications for developments are routinely screened for the need of an EIA and 
looking at the impacts that they could have on the natural environment, for example, anything that is likely to pollute, make noise, disturb, or could have another potential impact on nature. In fact, the process has been used to ensure that planned and necessary operations, such as the ongoing <coughs> mining work around the Falkland Islands, not only have the least amount of impact on the population, but also on the natural environment. In this instance, a small EIA highlighted the sensitivities around our unique wildlife, our beautiful penguins, um, sand dunes um, near rare vegetation sites, and vegetation more broadly. We identified a need for seasonality and careful management uh, for minefields being cleared around sensitive wildlife areas and showing that the disturbance was limited. We made sure that sand dunes were not left to blow away and smother nearby rare uh, plant areas. And in vegetated areas, we're making sure that the erosion risk is reduced uh, by, producing, um, by having um, appropriate uh, cover vegetation. Now, I know everyone's curious. Uh, no, the penguins cannot set off uh, minefields. They're just, yeah, they're just a little bit too small. Uh, so this is just one of the examples of how we use EIA, the EIA process to ensure sustainable development. Looking ahead, we have many challenges and I hope that this summit enables us to share the solutions that we are finding to overcome these challenges. Ensuring that our development is sustainable in the long term is important for the welfare of the natural environment and for the welfare of our communities and economy. I hope that this talk has given you an insight into what we are doing in our small corner of the world to ensure environmental sustainability. We are leveraging renewable energy sources, we're looking at modern waste management, and we're ensuring that the environment is not left behind during developments. Using this together, we can build partnerships to bridge gaps and look for the future of modern developments. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Denise. That was really interesting. Um, so our next speaker, I, I will introduce our next speaker in a moment, but I just wanted to let you all know um, that we have attendees joining from across, across the globe. It really is a global audience. So we have people from Trinidad, from Netherlands, from Curaçao, Alderney, Jersey, Orkney, Spain, the USA, Norfolk Island, Egypt, Seychelles, Nepal, Angola, US Virgin Islands, and many more. We're also especially pleased that we have a group of students um, from West Falkland who are also listening in. <laughs> um, and I'm sure we'll get a question from them sometime soon as well. I, I bet panel members that will be the most difficult one, no doubt. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's really, we really have this massive global audience. And um, just so our participants are aware as well, the three panel members in the Falklands um, from, who are speaking about the Falklands are actually physically in the Falklands at the moment. So they're sitting at the Sari offices in um, Stanley uh, in, in the Falkland Islands with the Falkland Islands flag flying behind them. <laughs> so now I'm gonna introduce you to our next panel member who is the Honourable Mark Pollard. Mark Pollard is a member of the Legislative Assembly of the Falkland Islands. He was ex elected into office in 2017 and has a passion for learning from others as well as traveling. And those of you who look closely at the photograph that I showed earlier, Mark was also um, part of the regional conference that was held in St. Helena last year as well. So over to you, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Tara. No, no pressure there with the international audience we have. Um, it's great to, uh, great to have you all joining us. Um, and, uh, and it's also great to be joining um, colleagues from St. Helena and um, representing the South Atlantic. It's, it's really good. Um, I'm just going to take you a very short sort of whistle-stop tour through the, um, through the economy of the Falklands and, um, and where we've been and, and essentially where I think we're going. Um, traditionally, the, um, the economy here is being centred around, um, around provisioning and supporting ships. Um, we had sealing and whaling um, in the past and, and agriculture. Um, we've seen a, a shift in, in more recent years towards fishing, um, primarily squid. It's the, um, our main source of GDP. Uh, the income to the government is mainly through licenses and, and corporation tax. Um, we've seen um, developments in agriculture. So agriculture is still 
the one of the more traditional industries and um, and is the largest employer outside of the government itself. And finally, tourism has seen sort of loops, leaps and bounds as well. With um, we get over or have been getting over sixty thousand um, cruise ship passengers a, a year and five thousand land based as well. So so that's been really taking off. Um, in terms of where the economy feels like it's going, I think we're always looking to to expand um, on the traditional industries we have already. Um, but as as we've already um, heard from the uh, from Dr. Brickle here about um, you know looking at science and the research institute, um, we've had traditional links with the British Antarctic Survey in the islands, um, conservation groups. It's um, there's a lot going on in terms of science, and I feel like that's really really developing. Um, we're looking at the possibility of hydrocarbons in the Falklands. In fact, they've been found in commercial quantities. It's a matter of, um, of, of you know, finding opportunities to exploit them, really. And, uh, and um, also, we, we remain sort of open to looking at all sorts of different industries. Um, we, we also have some pretty large threats to our industry and uh, in the Falkland Islands and our economy. And, um, and COVID-19 is... Um, it is clearly one that uh, that has been affecting the the entire world, and we not without that here. Um, Brexit is a is a a risk for us. We're certainly um, certainly campaigning as hard as we can to minimise uh, any risk that uh, that will affect our economy. And um, and lastly, you know, we we do have a, an aggressive neighbour that um, that claims our islands and um, with with sanctions against our economy. Um, so we'll look to try and remove those over time as well. We, we have, as a government, been investing in our infrastructure with physical connectivity, digital connectivity, uh, social enhancements, key enablers such as housing, um, port, power, um, all of the things that any other country has to do to, um, to survive, really. But I think key is our, our ethos, key to it is, um, is sustainable development. Um, and, and hopefully we're, we, we are safeguarding our natural environment and, um, and custodians of this, and, and I think our ethos has to be into the future to um, to try and tie these together as, as best as we possibly can. So I will I'll probably leave it there, um, Tara, and um, and see if we have any any questions. If that's okay. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark. So we do have questions. So the first one is from Cassia Cardis, and she was asking. Well, that's a great session. What well, was asking? Um, this is a question. The Falklands don't suffer from tropical cyclones as the Caribbean and Pacific Islands, but how vulnerable are they to impacts of climate change such as sea level rise and permafrost thawing? Paul, I don't know if you want to... Um, sure. Well, first of all, we now. don't have... Um, yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, thanks very much for the question. Those are really interesting questions. We don't, um, we don't have any permafrost here. Um, we're too, too far north uh, um, um, for that. Um, although um, climate change is likely to be uh, an, an issue here, um, we know it will affect the distribution of our plants, um, our important plants uh, for, for, for agriculture, uh, but also our native plants too. Um, and we also see uh, an increase in sea surface temperature, and I think by 2099 the projected increase is, is uh, um, by about 2.5 degrees above our sort of summer maxima. So um, there is a move now to really uh, look at this in detail and how it might impact not only our co uh, coastal communities that uh, maintain ecosystem function, um, but also um, how this might impact some of our um, important fishery uh, species too. So uh, a good example is Loligo, they spawn inshore. Um, they will be exposed at a critical point in their life history uh, to increasing summer um, maximum temperatures. Uh, so this is something we need to look at. Um, the Falkland Islands are not all low-lying, low so uh, um, with uh, small increases in, in sea level rise, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of us can, can, can build houses a bit further up hills and so on. But, uh, um, but yes, it is, an, it is an important issue and, and one we're studying at the moment. Okay, great, thanks. The next question is for Mark and Denise from Francesco Sindo, Sindo, Sindico. Can I kindly ask how the Falkland government has measured the success of its 2014, 18, 2014 to 18 islands plan? Um, by the way, congratulations on the plan, it was, as it was very forward looking for the time it was developed. 
the most it's common the there. I don't know if any if you can feedback on kind of the measurement of success. Yeah, so the so the plan is essentially the um, the manifesto of all the political leaders. Um, as we don't have a party system here, that's that's how it comes about. I thought that'd be fairly useful to explain that that part of the process. Um, so so therefore, it will likely be um, be in still the same plan until the next assembly step in um, late last late late next year. Um, in terms of measuring it, we, um, we we try to hold the government officers to account as often as we can, and we had a review fairly recently. Um, that I don't believe is a matter of public record yet, although although it probably should be in time. Um, I think we did circulate this at public meetings and um, and consulted with the public generally. Um, I don't think there's a, a set of metrics and KPIs that um, that we hold it to, but we do tend to take it out on the road and um, and have public meetings in Stanley as well as uh, moving around the um, the rest of the island as well and uh, and consulting the population. I hope that sort of helps to answer it maybe. Yeah, and I mean, from, from the uh, official side, um, the island plan really forms our key work programs uh, for that four year period. And so we, a lot of us see it as a checklist of these are the things that we are striving towards. Um, and uh, we build our targets um, and our work plans and our corporate plans around uh, the island's plan. Um, just, just briefly, the um, the other place where we will try to hold it into account is through our legislative assembly, where we do um, where we do uh, ask questions of portfolio holders to um, to justify where we're going and what we're doing in specific areas. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. So, just kind of some more in the chat. We're getting some more kind of locations of where people are at, and um, we have quite a few people linking in from St. Helena as well, which is great. Um, so there's one more question from Cassia. Um, some experts question cruises in the Arctic. What do you think about cruises in the Antarctic and around the Falklands? Um, I, I think you have to, um, with a lot of these things, you have to understand your environmental impacts. You have to um, uh, do things um, safely. You have to look at the environment and the impact um, as, as we um, as, as we tend to do here for any large scale developments. Um, if you can minimize the, the impact, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think we, we are obliged to do that really. Um, in terms of cruising in Antarctica, I don't have necessarily strong feelings about, um, about how that should be done or, or what should be done. Um, um, certainly around the Falklands, I, I do have stronger feelings. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we, we will have to constantly look at these things, but. Yeah, and, and these things do have to be managed sustainably, um, but they also provide the opportunity to educate. Um, not many people get to, to come to these wonderful places, and those that do have the opportunity take, take uh, their experiences back to friends and family um, about the importance of uh, sensitive areas like this. Um, and and just, just to note also um, that there is a group that operates, a large membership group that uh, represents uh, Tour, um, tour vessels that operate uh, uh, down in the Falklands and, and, and the Antarctic particularly, IATO, uh, and they have uh, very strict rules and regulations on, on the environment. Absolutely. Okay, um, and then there's one last question I think we have time for um, that relates to um, <coughs> relations with uh, Latin America. So I guess in terms of promoting sustainable development, how 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 is the Falklands working with other countries in um, Latin America? Yeah, we we have uh, um, a lot of joint work with uh, South American colleagues uh, on a on an in a number of areas, um, um, particularly around biodiversity and and remote remote sensing. Um, we all share similar issues in, in, in sort of southern parts of our countries, particularly understanding how uh, ecosystems work, um, baseline inventory is particularly key. These are all really big frontier areas and they're almost sub-Antarctic. They're difficult to get to, they're isolated and so on. Um, so we work, uh, um, you know, quite strongly with, with uh, a number of universities in South America. Um, and it's important otherwise we don't understand how our systems work in this neck of the woods. Okay. 
Brilliant. I think that's all we have time for. Um, we will open the floor again if we have time at the end to have um, questions across the whole panel. And there is a regional question, but I'll save that one until we kind of get to the wider panel. So thanks very much, um, Mark, Denise, and Paul. It's been really interesting. And now we're going to move from the Falklands. I think it's about four, how many thousand miles is it? Five, six <laughs> thousand miles north. Um, to our panel members in St. Helena. So while our panel members in St. Helena are waiting to set up, I just wanted to also let you know that um, as well as the panel in St. Helena, there's an a, um, open session at the St. Helena Community College. So the St. Helena Community College has opened its doors for people to come um, in to watch the panel session there. Um, I'm not sure if our participants are aware, but um, the bandwidths on both the Falklands and St. Lena are relatively um, small, limited, and therefore it isn't necessarily that easy for people to link into um, online virtual events um, from home or from their desk. So because of that, the St. Lena Community College has opened its doors to kind of a live audience there. Um, so without further ado, um, I will introduce you to our next speaker, who is um, in St. Lena in Jamestown. So as our Falklands panel is in Stanley, our St. Lena panel is um, physically sitting in Jamestown, the capital of St. Lena, and our first panelist from St. Helena is Wendy Bangeman. Wendy is the di Director of Education on St. Helena. She has worked in the department for at least three decades, progressing through leadership roles, and has a Master's in Education with Distinction. Wendy's talk is going to be looking at education enabling sustainable development in St. Helena. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Tara. Hello and a warm welcome to you all from the island of St. Helena. Located in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, our island is only 47 square miles in area. It has a hard exterior of sheer barren cliffs, but once you travel inland, you will be amazed at the beautiful scenery of green that is at the heart of the island. Saints, as we are known, have a fondness for our island we are a peaceful and friendly people who at times take for granted the special place we call home. We have a strong sense of community spirit and come together particularly in times of need. For most of us who live and work here, we would not give up our isolation for anything else in the world. Living in the middle of the South Atlantic has its challenges. One of these is getting goods to and from the island. We import almost everything that is consumed or used in our everyday life. It is quite common for us to have shortages if there is a delay in our ship, the Helena, arriving on time. However, this has made us resilient and resourceful. Saints are very practical people who can turn their hand to anything. If you want to make something out of virtually nothing, ask a saint. We currently export small quantities of honey, fit, coffee, and fish. And although small in quantity, our exports are great in quality. The St. Helena government is currently the biggest employer on the island with responsibility for the majority of the public services. We have a growing private sector who until the recent pandemic was beginning to thrive. We rely heavily on the British government to provide an annual financial aid package to support the island. The cost of living on St. Helena is relatively high. The current minimum wage is set at £3.18 per hour. Education and sustainable development on St. Helena. In 2015, the United Nations adopted 17 sustainable development goals as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Goal four focuses on quality education. 
On St. Helena, we see the value of investing in education for the benefit of the island and the wider world. Through my talk today, I will give an overview of the work that we are doing on St. Helena to improve education, skills and training for the people of St. Helena. The importance of sustainable development and improving our island is at the forefront of all of our planning. Our island has seven strategic goals. Goal two, all together better for children and young people directly relates to education. Supporting these goals are various strategic objectives, policy priorities and guidance documents that set out the required actions and targets. As a result, there has been much change and development in the education system to make it fit for purpose to underpin and support the sustainable development of St. Helena. On St. Helena, we have an inclusive system of education. We have the legal commitment to educate all children from the age of five through to 16 years. In addition to this, we support nursery education for three to five year olds and post-school education for 16 to 18 year olds. All schooling is free. Because St. Helena is small and isolated, we strive to ensure that our curriculum is wide and varied. We try to give our children the opportunity to explore different interests so they can find their career pathway and can then be more able to contribute to the future development of St. Helena. Whilst our curriculum broadly models that of the National Curriculum for England, we have the opportunity to be flexible. So we ensure that academic learning is supported by opportunities to develop skills in other areas, such as IT, music, cooking, agriculture, woodcraft, sports, and art. We also promote the student voice through our school councils. Children are given the opportunity to have a voice in their learning and development, and we encourage them to speak up for what they believe in. This helps them to develop their confidence and ability to articulate their needs. We are open to new ideas and to learn from others on how we can improve our education provision. Generally, attitudes to education have improved. More parents are seeing the importance of education and they want more opportunities and aspirations. And although improvements take time to embed, we are slowly progressing in our mission to improve educational standards on St. Helena. A challenge to our education provision comes in the form of resourcing, especially staffing. In our schools, we have a core of committed locally trained teaching staff. However, we also rely on external recruitment to meet our staffing requirements. To support the development of our local staff, we have engaged with the University of Cambridge, Open University and the TES Institute and are now able to offer accredited teacher training on Ireland. This initiative has enabled our local staff to become professionally qualified and competent. To date, at least 22 teachers have achieved at least a level four qualification in teaching and learning, with a further 15 teachers undertaking Cambridge teaching and learning courses. Eight have passed the certificate of higher education in primary education, and two have achieved the international PGCE increasing the percentage of qualified teachers in our staffing cohort. Another challenge is that of connectivity. Catering for the varied needs of our students is a challenge. Therefore, we rely on distance learning opportunities to support our students' options in years 10 through to 13. Our limited bandwidth, however, impacts on the opportunities that we can offer. Increased bandwidth comes at a cost, and on St. Helena, access to the internet is expensive. At least 13% of our allocated budget is dedicated to supporting internet access. It is hoped that as a result of the St. Connected project, bringing fiber optic connectivity, we will have increased access to the internet 
at an affordable price to further enhance our education provision. On completing compulsory schooling, all children have the opportunity for a placement on an apprenticeship program. This program provides opportunity to undertake further development through an academic or a vocational pathway. Due to the economic climate on St. Helena, financial support is provided in the form of an allowance to encourage students to join this program. Students who follow the academic apprenticeship route have the opportunity to apply for a university placement through a scholarship awards program. A requirement of this placement is that students demonstrate how their chosen career links with the strategic priorities of St. Helena and how they will contribute to the development of the island. Some of our scholarship students have returned to live and work on St. Helena and currently hold key positions. We are seeing increased numbers of students opting for sixth form education. This is a great achievement as we have increased numbers of young people with the potential to do well. However, catering for them all is a challenge. The St. Helena government is mindful of the significant expense in supporting off-island tertiary education and that this is unaffordable for most parents on St. Helena. So the government sponsors this program. However, this sponsorship is not enough. To address this, we are in the process of developing a scholarship trust to investigate additional funding streams, both locally and internationally, to give opportunity to more students to access higher education and training. Students who follow the vocational route are supported with work-based learning and training and further academic and professional development. I am pleased to say that the St. Helena government and many of our local businesses support work-based placement. We believe that the learning and development gained equips our young people with valuable knowledge and skills to prepare them for the world of work and this in turn benefits St. Helena. Last year, we supported 39 apprentices and this year we are supporting 38. The benefit of this program has been evidenced by a large proportion of our apprentices gaining permanent employment in the sector in which they were placed. In recent years, education has expanded to cater for our adult community. This is the remit of the lifelong learning sector, which manages the St. Helena Community College and our NVQ Center. Supporting the island in, in improving standards in literacy, numeracy and IT, the college offers these qualifications free of charge. We work closely with our private and public sectors to determine and address the training needs of the workforce. We utilize the skills on island, online opportunities and offshore expertise to support our training and development programs. Currently, we have 968 students registered in the college and we offer over 265 courses. Last year, we met 65% of the identified training needs of the workforce on St. Helena. Another branch of education that, support, that supports the Sustainable Development Goals is our recently launched Research Institute. The drive behind the creation of this official body was to grow the knowledge economy of St. Helena and manage research. The St. Helena Research Institute is a collaborative organization and works in partnership with other entities such as SARI, Enterprise St. Helena and the National Trust. We work together to ensure responsible research to support sustainable development and protection for St. Helena's environment, its heritage and its people. Since launching in November 2019, we have received over 27 applications to conduct research from over 14 different countries. Areas of interest include natural and earth sciences, health and well-being, social science and humanities. 
In summary, there is much that we are doing on St. Helena to improve educational standards for our people to enable them to have the necessary knowledge and skills to contribute to the sustainable development of our island. I will end with a quote from A. Toge Karlturk, an expert on, sus on sustainability. In order to create a sustainable world, we need to one, educate people, two, educate people, three, educate people. For every person left uneducated about the system of this sphere, the nature will make us all pay for it. Sustainability can only start in the mind. Thank you all for listening. And if you would like to find out more about education on St. Helena, feel free to contact me or leave a message in the chat room and I will be in contact with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Wendy, and that take home message, educate, educate, educate. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, we just heard, um, well, you guys will have seen in the chat as well that um, there are actually 25 participants in the St. Helena Community College. So it's a great online, um, uh, a great uh, in, on islands participation as well. So I'd now introduce our next speaker from St. Helena, the Honorable Russell Young. Russell Young is a member of the Legislative Assembly in St. Helena. He was elected into office in 2017 and is a member of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, the Public Health Committee and Chairman of the Employment Rights Committee. Russell has special interests in infrastructure construction, health and safety and economic growth and would love to help realize development that will allow St. Helena to flourish and to remain prosperous for the foreseeable future. And Russell's talk today is entitled St. Helena towards 100% energy production from renewables. Over to you, Russell. Thank you, Tara, and good afternoon to our listeners across the world. St. Helena was, until the recent opening of its airport, one of the most isolated places in the world. Geographically, it still is. High fuel and transport costs makes energy on St. Helena a huge challenge in an independent economy. Our reliance on fossil fuel has a severe impact on our financial budget and is an added cost to our daily commute from one location to another. But most of all, it has added a financial strain to, an, to each individual in how we live and do business and comes with environmental challenges. Our fuel arrives by ship approximately four to six times a year Electricity is not provided on the island at full cost recovery, and St. Helena government provides a fuel subsidy, which totals approximately 680,000 pounds per year. Connect St. Helena, the 100% government owned utility provider, has worked under extreme pressure to keep the costs to, to the consumer stable. Through a partnership approach, St. Helena government and Connect St. Helena has provided renewable energy for, from two renewable resources, solar and wind. The current wind farm and the construction of a 0.5 megawatt solar farm has taken the overall renewable electricity generation on the island from 9% produced by a wind farm initially constructed in the late 1990s with expansions in 2009 and 2014 to 29% in the summer of 2015. This had a major effect on the security of the supply on the island and has a positive impact on the otherwise heavily subsidized energy. Last year alone, renewable energy saved 0.7 million liters of diesel. Connect currently operates our power station using 2 million liters of diesel per annum. The cost to produce a unit of electricity is 39 pence with the infrastructure cost of supplying the energy to the consumer ac accounting for the remainder of the cost to the consumer at 46p per unit or 61 US cents. In 2016, St. Helena government recognizing the extreme value that renewable energy could provide to our economy and development growth set about developing an energy strategy which had the objective of becoming 100% reliant on renewable energy by 2022. 
a sustainable economy, a sustainable economic development plan sets out to develop St. Helena's industry, promote sustainable and green growth, increase our skilled workforce and ensure that everyone on St. Helena prospers from sustainable economic development. The vision is to achieve which is economically, environmentally and socially sustainable by increasing the standard of living and quality of life, reducing reliance aid from the UK in the longer term, whilst affording to maintain the island's infrastructure, achieve more money coming onto the island than going out and sustaining and improving St. Helena's natural resources for future generations, as well as meeting St. Helena's international obligation in terms of climate change. A project was developed to enable St. Helena to maximize the potential from renewable resources. We wanted to encompass wind and solar energy and battery storage, whereby the generated power could be stored and used when required. This was a crucial part of our project. And although our current supply of renewable energy is maintained, there is no way of storing power. So during the off-peak periods, most of the power generated is discarded. The project encouraged green technology and practices on Ireland to enhance our ecotourism and green credentials, reduce the use on fossil fuel and be cost effective. Through an international open tender process, Cash Global, a UK registered company was selected and in May 2020, Connect St. Helena Limited signed a power purchase agreement with Cash Global to provide wind turbine solar power and battery storage capacity to St. Helena, which will significantly increase the renewable energy capacity on the island, resulting in the majority of the island's energy needs being met through renewable resources. The signing of this contract is a giant step forward for St. Helena in delivering the priorities of the St. Helena government energy strategy. Through the agreement with PASH, St. Helena can stand up as an exemplar of green growth across the British Overseas Territories, and is proud to be on track to, to meet the goals of the St. Helena Energy Strategy. In the midst of these challenging times, the signing of the contract between Connect and Patch Global represents a significant milestone. Patch Global will undertake both phases, at one and two, of their proposal in tandem, estimated to be delivered to the island during the course of 2021. In the first instance, they will be providing a full 560 kilowatt per hour, 500 kW solar farm, 2.7 megawatt wind farm made up of three turbines and a 3.2 megawatt hour, 3.5 megawatt battery. This will generate at least 9.133 gigawatt per hour per annum. This demonstrates St. Helena's commitment to the environment and will make the island a global leader in renewable technology. Additional measures to support energy efficiency has also been taken, for example, lowering import duty for energy efficient consumer goods, improvements made to increase public transport, introducing emissions-based vehicle import duty, and reducing customs duty for renewable energy products. Development permission has already been granted to locate the wind turbines on Deadwood Plain, home to the current wind turbines, and the solar panels will be located adjacent to the existing solar site at the rifle range Ladder Hill. Deadwood Plain has excellent wind characteristics with the gentle slopes, compressing the air that flows in from the South Atlantic Ocean. It is also the home of the threatened endemic Charadrius sancha helenia, known locally as the wirebird or St. Helenium plover. So it is with extreme care the wind turbines are constructed and operated. The wind turbines and wirebirds exist in harmony with numbers increasing as a result of the excellent work undertaken by local conservationists. And they can be observed nesting and foraging beneath the wind turbines. This process will continue with the construction and operation of the additional wind turbines. St. Helena has a variety of microclimates ranging from cloud forest to barren desert environments. The north gentle facing slopes in Lower Half Tree Hollow receive extensive amounts of sunshine, making it an excellent site for solar generation. 
The site is a former large Boer rifle range and is close to the most densely populated area of the island. The proximity to consumers reduced transmission losses to maximize the quantity of usable electricity. Solar energy on St. Helena currently provides 7.5% of St. Helena's electricity demand. Environmental impact assessments have been undertaken to ensure construction and operation of renewable energy technologies does not have a negative impact on the island's unique flora and fauna, not least with regards to the endemic wirebird. Once fully operational, the project will displace approximately 2,300 metric tons of diesel. This is equivalent of about 5,240 tons of CO2, or approximately 1.2 tons of capita of the island's population. There is also a potential CO2 savings on freight of fuel to the island, if this is calculated purely on decreased tonnage of fuel freight needed. This would be the equivalent to approximately 285 tons of CO2. Together, these figures total 5,525 tons CO2, or almost 1.3 tons per capita. Taking into account the baseline operational figures for 2014 and the projected 2022 accounting baseline operation figures, at 100% renewable energy, this will account for a financial saving of £2,275,000. In addition to the positive effects, impacts the transformation to renewable energy will also bring local environmental improvements. Local air quality in Rupert's Valley, where the generators are located close to the local community, will improve as a result. The risk the risk of fuel leaks into our unique marine environment will be reduced as the fuel is currently offloaded by floating pipeline from a moored tanker, a practice that has significant risk. New employment opportunities are a direct result of the investment and the local community will be upskilled to allow them to undertake higher grade jobs. Indirect benefits can see financial savings channeled into other investments for the benefit of the local community in infrastructure environment and socially focused services. The 100% renewable energy system also enables significant public savings for reinvestment for community benefit. Most of all, the benefits will be felt by the consumer once everything is in place, as it will contribute to a reduced energy cost to the consumer. In May 2018, St. Helena won the Greening Islands Award in the energy category for our 100% renewable St. Helena project to become 100% energy self-sufficient by 2022. By partnering with a local reputable renewable energy company, a mixed model strategy aims to provide renewable energy solutions via wind and solar generation. There are opportunities to go beyond this arrangement, including the potential to reduce government footprint in businesses, and this extends to other areas of activity and supply. It is now envisaged that due to COVID-19 pandemic, PESH will still be able to meet their timeline and should have components of their project to, deli to be delivered to the island by the end of the financial year. In the meantime, it is also anticipated that the two chosen sites for this project will be ready. There are exciting times ahead for St. Helena in our quest to becoming 100% self-sufficient to renewable energy by April 2022. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Russell. 100% renewable by 2020. When we spoke about um, the South Atlantic being world leading, I think we have quite a lot of targets here that will put us up there um, as case studies for the world, which is really exciting. Um, so just for the speakers and presenters, in case you aren't aware um, and not following the chat, there actually is quite a lot happening in the chat with some really positive comments about the work that's going on and about the talks. Um, so there's lots of positive feedback there from all around the world. Um, and I'm sure that you can pick up individually with some of the very specific questions that people are asking. Um, but I'll feed some of the, the kind of wider questions through to the panel um, 
after our next speaker um, has given his intervention. So I'd like to welcome our next and final speaker from St. Helena, uh, Darren Henry. Darren is a St. Helenian entrepreneur specializing in photography, digital media, and marketing. He is passionate about recognizing the fragility of St. Helena culture in the face of development and helping to document and preserve the stories of its people. In 2019, Darren and his wife Sharon built and launched Inside St. Helena, the island's very first mobile phone app. So Darren's talk is going to be looking at growing a digital economy. Over to you, Darren. Okay, thank you, Tara. Um, good day to everybody who's uh, tuning in. In July 2019, Google and Apple had available more than 6 million apps between them, and global downloads exceeded a staggering 200 billion. It's clear that mobile phone apps are very much a significant digital platform for how the world shares information, is entertained, communicates, and does business. In contrast, here on St. Helena, at the same time period, my wife and I had just launched Inside St. Helena, the island's very first app. The numbers are a stark indicator of how far St. Helena is lagging behind in this particular field. In 2020, COVID-19 turned the world upside down. Yet in the middle of all the chaos, the resilience of the digital economy slowly became apparent. Everyday life in many areas switched to the online space, working from home, teaching classes, business meetings and family gatherings. From sports to entertainment, from church services to tourism services, everyone who could went virtual. While high street shops closed down, online retail has opened up. In the United States, the top 2,000 e-commerce websites registered a 125% average increase in traffic. In the UK, following the lockdown announcement, home and leisure online retail transactions jumped by 200%. Of course, these trends will change again as the pandemic comes under control, but still, Many people around the world will continue to shop online in greater volumes than pre-COVID-19. The Globe Newswire predicts e-commerce will account for a third of all global retail sales by 2024. For small islands like St. Helena, this is our wake-up call. But what will it take for the island to grow our digital economy? The challenges as I, as I see them fall into two main areas. One, our size and isolation. Two, our small island culture. Let's look at isolation first. Consider the size of St. Helena, so tiny it could fit inside London's M25 circular motorway 18 times over with plenty of room to spare. Consider our location in the South Atlantic more than 1,000 miles from the nearest landmass, and with a population that is well below 5,000 people. These factors all combine to add another element of isolation, one from the global digital environment. The increasing layers of online security checks seldom make allowances for small islands like St. Helena. For a start, very few islanders have international banking accounts. The simple process of buying a domain name and organizing website hosting can be a minefield to navigate from St. Helena. Many online registration and payment forms don't recognize the St. Helena postcode. The two-step authentication gateway being used more and more for online access is a nightmare for anyone operating from St. Helena. If you're lucky enough to own an overseas bank account, Try getting a new debit card delivered through the mail before the activation time limit expires. So just a few of the obstacles that isolation brings. The second big challenge is small island culture. Small communities tend to be more resistant and fearful to change. It's often easier to ignore the silent and invisible digital revolution than deal with the headache of integrating it into island life. Traditional industries, 
such as agriculture, fishing, and construction can dominate discussions at a political level. When this happens, digital entrepreneurship and innovation tend to fall down the priority list rather than being embraced as a potential lifeline for sectors desperately in need of modernizing. To grow the digital economy on small islands like St. Helena, we need to invest faith in the human capital. We need to recognize the value of the creators, the innovators, and the risk takers who persevere in overcoming obstacles of isolation to clear a pathway for tomorrow's ideas. Within two years, a transatlantic submarine fiber optic cable is expected to be landed here on St. Helena, bringing with it the promise of genuine high-speed connectivity. The potential of the opportunities that will come with it are enormous. But a lot can change in two years. In fact, 2020 has shown us the whole world can change in just a few short months. So we should learn the lessons, recognize and respond to the worldwide trend. The time for St. Lena to focus on building the digital economy is now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darren. And I think the challenges of not being connected to the digital environment aren't really understood um, globally where that is taken for normal in, taken as normal in so many countries now. Um, and as I said, you know, the, today is a case in point with um, everybody being connected through nodes, really, because of the speed of the bandwidth being such a limitation to um, joining virtual environments. So that's the end of our um, talks, which have been really inspiring. It's amazing to see all the wonderful things that are happening. Um, and, and I think Lolly commented in the chat, when you package it up and give a talk about it, it really shows exactly how much is happening in the Falklands and in St. Helena. Uh, we have a lot to be proud of. I have a question now that's, that came in. So we just, um, I'm gonna look for some more outward looking questions, um, not ones that are very specific. So one that probably can go to both um, the St. Helena and the Falklands panels. Um, this is from Kerville in Trinidad and Tobago. So his question is built on the question that I asked earlier around um, connections to Latin America. Um, are there any connections or any kind of collaborations that have been built with um, the African nations? Maybe if I'll put that to San Luna first since you guys are closer. Um, yes, sir. Uh, as we all know here from St. Lena and for those who are, uh, are listening to us might also uh, understand at this time, St. Lena has a very large connection with uh, Cape Town. And uh, just recently, we also had uh, a member from the Ethiopian government who, who arrived here on St. Lena as well. Uh, the slave trade also plays a big part in our history. So all of that is considered when we try to uh, integrate with what we would like to achieve in taking St. Helena forward. So for our side from St. Helena, yes, our, our connections with South Africa has always been strong. And for me, I think that will always remain. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, anybody else from the panel want to add anything before I pose? Yeah, just, so just I, in I terms of time. Paul, uh, sorry, I was, I was, <laughs> No, I was, I was asking the Selena panel first before I put it to the Falklands panel if there was anything that anybody else from St. Helena, no problem. If anybody else from St. Helena wanted to add? Uh, no, not really. That's, okay. that's good, but Russ. <laughs> so, so, Paul, I should have let you carry it, continue. Over to you, sorry. That's okay, no worries. Um, yeah, in terms of science, we uh, work with um, so, uh, sort of university institutions and research institutions uh, in in South Africa, um, and Namibia, and Angola. So there are some, some quite strong connections there, uh, particularly with Namibia and South Africa. And, and just, um, just on the community at large and, and links with, um, with Africa, um, we, we recently had a, an arrangement between the Chamber of Commerce and a, and a South African um, company for, um, for looking for, we're always um, short, we're quite often short of workers in the Falkland Islands. So, um, so we've seen some changes there. Plus, our demining program was um, 
was staffed almost um, solely by by African workers, and um, and meant, you know quite a few have chosen to stay and um, and add to the multicultural society that is the Falklands. So we are seeing stronger links, I think. Okay, interesting. Um, so the next question, and maybe it's an unfair question, but I'll put it to you <laughs> um, because I know nobody is here is from the banking has a banking background, but Darren's um, point about the problem of access kind of living in remote areas, um, access to credit cards, international currency, security check requirements. So this is um, Abigail from Indonesia saying that she can really relate to those types of issues and was wondering if there's any um, solutions that uh, have been implemented in the Falklands or Semina. I don't know if there's kind of how, how, how does it work? I, I mean, we've um, seen recently some some, um, some links here between um, the Bank of Gibraltar and with Square and Mastercard as well. Um, I won't talk extensively about those. Um, it's been been sort of tackled by colleagues of mine and uh, and government officers, but um, we can certainly try and try and dig out some information on that to if that okay. can help to pass that on. Yeah. No, thanks. I think it's I, from my perspective, it's just an interesting point that you know it isn't only a remote island issue. It's, so a lot of the issues that we speak about that are, uh, um, we associate with remoteness are actually um, similar for remote remote areas globally, not necessarily only islands. You know, um, so so I think it's interesting. Darren, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, just to um, add to what they just said from the Falklands, we we have been. Um, introduced to the Gibraltar connection as well, which um, I'm not sure if anybody on Ireland yet has actually completed the process of actually setting up um, the, the banking, but that um, promises to give us that international banking link um, that, that we need. Um, and, and locally here on the island, the Bank of St. Lena are in the process of um, introducing some new products that will um, go some way towards helping, especially with things like travel, so that people can have sort of top up pay as you go um, credit debit type cards. So I think that um, the island is, is very much aware of the problem and we're trying to um, come up with solutions, but it's a, it's a case of trying to get this, this, the, that rate of progress to keep up with the demand of, of what we need in, you know, in order to operate in that digital environment. Okay, brilliant, thanks very much. And this is an interesting one from Oliver Crozier, who says, what are the main exports that San Lina could develop. He knows that islanders are exporting themselves to other islands. Um, and, and I guess the, the movement of people is, is key, but are there any, um, is there anything on the horizon around uh, exports? Um, okay, Tara, so uh, yes, thanks for uh, the question. And yes, we do export more St. Linians than we, we have for uh, <laughs> any growth within our economy. But yes, uh, we have small exportations on honey, coffee, and fish. And uh, on the last two, we are actually trying to uh, develop those products so that we can encourage more people to become involved and participate and uh, be allowing us to export a lot more of those uh, two products. It's uh, kind of ironic because St. Lena really have anything else that we can actually export. Although there uh, were times way back where St. Lena was well known for uh, being able to allow its vegetables to be exported due to the opening of the Suez Canal that unfortunately took away the amount of ships that traveled around the, the uh, Horn of the Cape and came coming through to the South Atlantic up to the North. And so that went away. And now we actually import more than we can export. So in going forward in terms of our SEDP and other 10 year plans, we are trying to find other sources that we can export and that may come within part and parcel with one of our other items that the island used to export heavily in the 60s and 70s and that is our flax. Okay, thanks very much. So this one is for the Falklands from Lalith. Um, Gunawardena. Um, she was, or well, they were asking, the Falkland Islands was looking at upgrading their power plant with more diesel units. Was that done or, or is it now looking at renewable sources? Uh, so in terms of our uh, power station, we are looking to upgrade the entire systems that we run 
Uh, so whilst we're still, uh, we'll still be relying on diesel, we're looking at more efficient uh, diesel generators. And so hopefully also being able to increase the renewables uh, in that energy mix. Yeah, I think whilst it might be fantastic to go to 100%, I think technology is quite complex in terms of power storage. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously we have varying wind speeds and so on. So um, if you're to supply power on demand, I think uh, um, that becomes quite complex. Um, it's not my area, but uh, that's my understanding. I, I think as an assembly, we, um, you know, the elected members are, are keen to look at doing as much renewably as we can. And um, we are in the process of designing a new power station, um, which will be predominantly diesel generators. Um, and there's, there's a hope that these will be the last diesel generators we ever buy or build. Yeah, but I think it's important to note that also um, the energy from renewables is around about 40%. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Current. 40% in Stanley and 100% in Camp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. I, so another question, and this one probably is to Wendy, is from um, Christopher Williams, and he's said great insights from the Saint Helena panel on human capital and education. Are there any initiatives to deepen and extend the international exchange of students and learners? from and to the island? Um, yes, I, I guess that is something that can be explored. Um, at the moment, like I said earlier, through our scholarship awards program, we normally um, send our students to the UK. Um, at the moment, we aren't actually bringing in anybody to the island, but that is um, an opportunity that we can explore further. Yeah, and there was a connection with Ascension I seem to recall when we were chatting earlier. Um, so in the past, I think one, when students had completed their education on Ascension Island, they would go to the UK to study their A-levels. At the moment, um, we're seeing them coming to St. Helena now to study for their higher education, their AS and their A-levels here on Ireland. Um, in the past, we also used to have um, students coming to St. Helena from Tristan um, to complete their studies in our secondary education. But from Tristan, that hasn't happened in, um, in a while. Although in recent conversations with um, the administrator on, on Tristan, well, the previous administrator, he was trying to see if that could be revived. But at the moment, um, it's very much centered on our sister islands and children coming from those islands to St. Helena. Brilliant. And I think that is us out of time. So um, with the last word from education, 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 which I think <laughs> we're all on the same page about. Um, I think the, the youth are the future of our islands and all islands. Um, I'd like to thank the Falklands panel and speakers, the Semlina panel speakers, everybody in the background has organized everything to make this happen. And of course, to all our multiple participants from all over the world and to our very active chat that I've been trying to track very unsuccessfully. But I'm sure we will go through the chat and all of the questions um, after the session and endeavor to get back to anybody who's really interested in some specifics about the work that is happening in the South Atlantic. So thank you, everybody. Um, have a lovely weekend. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.